you so much, Patrick. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I, I think I'm the only non-Brit here, so I, I'm demanding persecuted minority status. Um, but I also want to thank uh, Tim Bayerhelm for having recruited me to this extremely interesting Worldwide Wednesday. So, um, indeed, I will take... Um, I will, I will try to answer the same question as George and, 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 and Jeremy, but uh, I will use my own take on it. Uh, so my answer to the question, can the UK and the EU survive great power rivalry is yes, but only as part of a global West. And I believe so for five reasons. First, the EU and the UK alone are not a uh, great power vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, uh, and in three three sub points to this, you know, after twenty fourth of February twenty twenty two, there was what what I would define as a, an an arc of solidity that reached from the United States to Britain to Northern Europe and then down the eastern flank, and and it was above all within that arc of solidity. It was two countries, and it was UK and above all the US that kept Ukraine alive. If it was for continental Europe, if it was for, for especially the Western part of the current European Union, it, Ukraine would be an occupied country. Let's face that. So a uh, second sub point on this, um, it, it, we will even in the future be only able to deter a, uh, a superpower Russia, a, a Russia that, that possesses nuclear weapons on, uh, on all four levels that I see of, of warfare from hybrid to conventional to tactical nuclear to strategic nuclear with the United States. Uh, without that, we can forget about deterring uh, a power such as, such as Russia. And, and, and third sub point here is that reconstructing Ukraine will only be possible with a perspective of EU membership of Ukraine. And EU membership of Ukraine will only make sense with the perspective of NATO membership of Ukraine. And here again, we are uh, with the United States. So our, it, it, our utmost interest will have to be to keep the United States involved in European security, engaged and involved in European security. Second large point, the UK and the EU alone are not a great power vis-a-vis -vis China. China's economic, military, and political weight is already way too big for Europe to counter alone. So this whole thing about you know being a third pole and so on, that uh, it's, this is rhetoric that President Macron likes to resort to once in a while, is, uh, uh, is nonsense. <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, the trend in Europe is uh, clearly uh, that the European Union needs to respond to a threat. I mean, you know, five, six, seven years ago, that was not consensus in Europe at all. Hardly anyone was talking like that in Brussels. But now the trend goes towards countering the, uh, uh, the Communist Party of China and help Taiwan deter Chinese aggression. Um, we are still slower on this than the US, and we have great disparities inside the European Union on this, but the trend is clear and it points in the same direction. Um, also, I'd like to emphasize how much of a fan of the concept of strategic autonomy for the European Union the Chinese Communist Party is. Let's not forget, I mean, there is a reason why they encourage us so much to develop our strategic autonomy because of course they mean by that a Europe that is separate from the United States. And another aspect of this is that a, a therefore for all these reasons a common transatlantic a strategy on de-risking relations with China in tech exports, in supply chain resilience and in market dependency is direly necessary. What do I mean by market dependency? Um, you know, I think that the rhetoric about de-risking is misleading if it only refers to rare earths and um, if it only refers to pharmaceuticals and so on. 
uh, look at the behavior of Germany's car makers, who maybe reminds me of junkies threatened with withdrawal when they are faced with uh, some kind of denial of market access to China. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it, the very the very trade volume and the number of jobs involved here, for example, if we take German car makers, uh, is a fantastic instrument for Chinese blackmail. And China has been using this and will use it. So that means de-risking also entails a certain amount of, let's say, disengagement in order to avoid the ugly word decoupling. Third big point, the future of transatlantic relations is not exclusively in the hands of the next US president. Uh, so much for the 2024 problem. I think that we Europeans play an important role, even if there, there is a Trump or Trumpist administration. Um, according to all I know and hear from Washington, the majority of the Republican Party in Congress and outside does not want to ditch Ukraine, withdraw from Europe and entirely pivot to China or to go into some kind of splendid isolation. But they just expect more from Europeans in terms of defense spending and willingness to share the cost of securing democracy. So, it, you know, the purpose that, I mean, we all agree that Europe must spend more and there should actually be a stronger European pillar in NATO. But the goal of this is not to replace the United States, it is to keep them involved in European security. And the same principle applies to Europe's China policy. To become a third pole or sitting on the fence between the US and China and their rivalry is toxic for transatlantic relations. That kind of talk is toxic. To define Europe and East Asia as interconnected vessels is the way forward. You know, it's fantastic how the Taiwanese have got it. The Japanese have got it. Um, they completely understand that the war in Ukraine it is directly uh, connected to a possible future conflict, a possible future Chinese aggression against Taiwan or other expansionist measures in East Asia, in the Indo-Pacific. If they understand it, why is President Macron still saying that Taiwan is not our business, we should not blindly follow the US, no vassalism and all this talk? So um, it, I, I believe the contrary. I think that if we want to keep America involved under any administration after 2024, we will precisely for our own good and for the sake of transatlantic relations, have to be more active with China together with the United States. Fourth big point, the global South, and that's been mentioned by, by George and others, um, the global South indeed can be addressed more effectively. So first of all, Ukraine must win the war. I mean, that will in itself work miracles to convince the global South that siding uh, with Russia means being on the losing side of history here. A Ukrainian victory and a clear Russian defeat will help to convince countries in the global South that uh, this is indeed so. Neither Ukraine nor NATO member states should confuse the West unity with the international mood regarding Russia's full-scale war. I mean, that's a bit of a no-brainer in the meantime. When I wrote this in an article three months ago, it was a bit newer than, than it is now. So we should clearly own up to past mistakes while insisting on the uniquely criminal and dangerous character of Russia's war. I mean, Iraq 2003 was a huge mistake, but it's in no mean, by no means comparable. So respectful communication must go hand in hand with concrete efforts to address the material issues and the dependencies in the global south. You know, uh, and this ranges from weapon systems to, uh, to grain, to technology, uh, to finance. Uh, and finally, I think it is important to say that Ukraine and Central European states have special credibility in this effort to address the global south. Ukraine is doing a fantastic job these days in talking to African countries, talking to Latin American countries. It's not working yet, but I think there are there, there should be ways to, to, to address these issues. And as I said, Central Europe, which has never had colonies really, uh, and Ukraine are the right partners here. Uh, last, last point, 
I do think that democracy versus autocracy works as a concept, but it only works in concentric circles. In other words, at a time when autocracies openly cooperate with each other, stabilize one another, and jointly undermine democracies, it is nonsense to reject the democracy versus autocracy concept altogether. But indeed, the world cannot be divided into black and white. We need to cooperate with some autocracies. Some non-Western democracies are not necessarily our friends, and the West has its own black sheep, such as Poland and Hungary. So the best way to cope with this is to think in concentric circles with in the middle of the Euro-Atlantic space, around that like-minded democracies around the world, and yes, indeed, non-revisionist autocracies will have to be our partners against the powers that want to revise the global system. So taking into account these five points, I think Europe has the best chances in the world to survive as part of a democratic global West. Thank you.